going on guys welcome back to the pt coffee cast brought to you by the movement my name is dalton and alongside me today is my beautifully bearded friend william william how are we doing today i'm doing good i'm excited you know we haven't done like a like an interview like this in a while so it's gonna be fun yeah, today is like a big throw it back day. We were ranting before we got on this podcast, um, which is what started the, the PT Coffee Cast. Now we're doing a Zoom interview episode, which I felt like for one year we lived on Zoom doing all those recordings. So it's a, uh, I feel at home, you know, and I'm excited to to dive into this episode. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm also like, I don't know about you, but I'm- this is my third coffee this morning. So yeah, we're, we're about, we're at the same level. We're, we're, we're at home, you know, that's where we want to be. But guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you aren't subscribed yet, you can do so on your podcast platform, whether that be Apple podcast, Spotify, wherever you're listening, we are on YouTube. So this is on YouTube video episodes. So you guys can head over to the YouTube channel, subscribe there. We're trying to get those subscribers up to 500 this year. That's the goal for the movement. So if you want to be part of that, helping us get there, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then if you want to learn about all things mentorship, uh, head over to the movementmentorship.com. You can check that out and see if it works for you. But today we got an interview i'm super excited to dive into this episode with ricky fernandez he's the burnout coach he's a physio Um, he's on a mission to help healthcare workers beat burnout so they can lead fulfilling professional and personal lives i'm super stoked to have him on the podcast ricky how we doing fantastic i love the intro i don't really like introducing myself so i'd rather you be my hype man for me I'll hype you up. That is one of the weirdest things is like when people are like, Hey, why don't you tell me a little bit about, you know, yourself? And I, and I'll be like, all right, like, where do we start? Like when I was two or, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want like the introduction that I would give my therapist when we're first meeting? Do you want like the networking one, the family member one? There's so many different versions of it for sure. But you hit the nail on the head. It seems like you guys did a little bit of, uh, uh, I think you ran a background check on me before getting this set up. So (laughs) you went through, you went through the typical research uh, system that we have here at the, at the PT coffee cast. But um, you know, where where I would like to start Ricky is kind of with the, with the physio and like what kind of drove you into PT. Um, I think that'd be a great place to start and then we can work off of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, first and foremost, thank you guys for having me on. Um, There's not a lot of, I would say PT movements, like I think of the movement as I'm using the same word, but it's it's a brand that's bigger than just like a clinic that I really align with and resonate with. So I very much appreciate being on here today. Um, honestly, you guys played an integral part in my early physical therapy journey. So we have to go way back, like back to, you know, not being an infant, but like elementary school, high school days, um, my vision for the longest time was that I was going to be a doctor. And I thought that like medical school was the way it's what, when my dad would like introduce me to his friends as I was a little kid, you had three options. It was like, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or you're a judge. And I'm like, great. You just had to choose the three hardest things that are possible to do. I love that you set the bar so unbelievably high. Um, So like I latched on to being a doctor. Science was nice. I enjoyed the human body and anatomy. And that was kind of like the thing that was driving me through high school through college. It's why I majored in biology. And I thought that that was going to be the way. And honestly, what happened was, I remember sitting down for the MCAT prep course, which is basically hell on earth. And I remember at that time, I also was entering a couple years into my relationship with my now spouse. And things were just kind of coming into my field of vision of like, is this what I want to do? Like, am I willing to put in the time and the effort into going to medical school, doing this MCAT prep prep course. And to be honest, what I realized probably around my junior year of college was like, no, I'm not. I actually am not particularly passionate about medicine. I do enjoy helping people. I like the idea of medicine, but I'm not willing to go back into this mode of grinding through the biomedical sciences and then doing a bunch of residencies. And so that, that was kind of a shifting point for me because I was about to graduate college and I was like, cool, medical school, that's gone. I'm not going to be doing that. What do I do? Like, I'm going to graduate next year. I need to pick something. And so I played a little bit of baseball in college that 
you guys may or may not know this, but I played a little bit of baseball in college and strength and conditioning has always been a big thing in my life. I was very overweight early on in high school and like finding the gym is something that gave me a little bit more confidence. It helped me lose weight. We had like a little gym family in high school that was really cool and we'd hang out after school. And it was kind of just a good mixture of things happening at once where I was on Instagram a lot and a couple like, I don't know if you guys even remember these people, but like strength coach therapy, Dr. Jacob Harden, the muscle doc, like these are dudes that would just pop up on my algorithm because I guess I was looking at bros lifting just like in that culture. And I was like, oh snap, like they're lifting, they're jacked. They're also promoting rehab in a way that I'd never saw before. They're chiros, they're physios. And so like a little bit of a light bulb moment happened at that time where I was like, hmm, there is some intersection here between strength and conditioning and rehab that I haven't considered. No one in my school I knew was gonna be a physical therapist or even a chiropractor. And so I just was like, this is intriguing. I'm gonna go down this route. And so essentially what I had to do was, <laughs> I was like messaging these accounts. I was like, hey, like, should I become a chiro? Should I become a physio? Are there books that you recommend? I remember reading anatomy trains when I was like still in college. And I was like, yeah. I don't know what the hell any of this means, but I know what a sling is. <laughs> <laughs> so like, just like trying to, trying to see if like this content resonated with me and I wanted to pursue it more than some of the medical pharmacology things that I couldn't care less about. And it did, it hit home. Honestly, um, I ended up deciding like I wanted to become a physio because a, I get to help people. And also I get to be this clinician who can bring the gym into rehab. It was something that helped me a lot in my life. And I don't think enough people to this day are even meeting like minimal um, movement guidelines. And so it was just like a vision that I had at that moment of like, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to do. I don't want to go down the route of Cairo. There's a lot of like respectable and knowledgeable Kairos, but I just, I wasn't willing to bear that cross of having to advocate for myself as being a different Cairo who's more progressive and actually knows what they're talking about. So Physios was like the safe choice for me at that point. Also at this time, I graduated and it just happened to be like stroke of luck. My wife and I moved here to, uh, to St. Louis and we both happened to get into the same school, both of our different graduate programs, but the same school. And they just both happened to be like number one in the nation for their respective disciplines. And so I was like, this is amazing. Like everything's falling into place. Um, I'm able to go to this amazing school. I'm able to, to start to begin to build my life with my partner. And I'm in a profession that I like have a newfound passion for and I care about. And so that was kind of the beginning of that for me. I, I like to joke that I have an existential crisis every three or four years, because as you can tell now, I'm a burnout coach. I'm not really a fully practicing physio. So that's, we'll probably get into where that happened today, but that was kind of like the early journey for me. And I'm so grateful for it. And I, and I want people, if you grab any nugget or principle out of that, it's, it's going to sound very cliche, but you got to follow where your heart's taking you and you have to pay attention to how you are feeling about a certain process. Like if you want to achieve a certain destination, career outcome, the process can't suck. It can be challenging, but it can't be wholly dreadful. And that was what it felt like for me going down the medical route. And if that's what it feels like for you going down, whatever your respective route is, listen to that message, pay attention because you're probably have something that you are more deserving of and that's better for you. So that's the, the early origin story of Ricky. <laughs> Yeah. Love it. Um, yeah. I mean, the path is, is like, I agree with you. I think there's like a lot of similarities between like what you just described and what Will and I have kind of gone through, you know, excuse me, over the years um, of like getting to, to where we are now. And I think like your point there at the end um, is, is huge. And, and we encourage people a lot of times and, and a big thing we do, you know, uh, for like new grads and people moving into practice is like, being self-aware of like what they want to get out of their career and identifying what that path looks like. And if they are headed down the path that they want, does this feel right based off of your values and your standards and how you want to show up as a clinician so that you can kind of carve that path 
the right way, similar to what you were just were talking about, where you recognize like, yeah, I don't really want to go into med school, right? So I think the same thing applies to like physios when you're stepping out into the world of physio, whether it's like, you're not really sure what realm you want to go into, whether it's like neuro or ortho or cardio, or if you're in a particular like area, such as like ortho or outpatient, um, what even within that is the path? for you and are you on the right path because I think a lot of people to your point kind of get trapped in a path that maybe isn't the right thing for them and then I would probably factor that factors into burnout in a lot of like what we'll probably get into but yeah I think I think those were like all all really great points 100 percent 100 percent it's you know I think it's part of the human condition a lot of us fall into this pattern for whatever reason but a lot of times we like assume what makes others happy will make us happy and we see people that we look up to in our field and assume like if i can achieve what they've achieved it's going to just transfer to a life of fulfillment and contentment and peace and joy and oftentimes it doesn't because we're all different and we have different values and principles and i wish honestly back in physical therapy school we took some time to uncover like what are those values that you care about what are those principles that you care about don't just pick a particular specialty I, i do want you to figure that out at some point but also like, what are you trying to get out of this experience? How is it supposed to fit into your day-to-day life, the patients that you're working with and the feelings you'll get after you go to work? This is like the soft skills, you know, less technical, concrete conversations that we don't always have in physical therapy school. And I'm like, no, this is the time to have it because Mm -hmm. we're about to enter a vast realm of possibilities. So don't silo yourself to something that you just saw someone on Instagram do. And you're like, it looks cool to work in a gym and rehab athletes. That'll probably be the best path for for me. Might not be the case. I think uh, what, I wonder if you agree with this. Like, I feel like there's a lot of also social pressure and like maybe there may be some resistance or at least like the perception that there might be some resistance to going and doing something a certain way. You know, like I, I felt like we experienced that when we were in uh, school and we wanted to, we had certain beliefs that maybe didn't, weren't held by like people that were respected in that community. And so like, I think sometimes it's hard for people to, to look at that and be like, should I do this? hundred percent. You're describing the, the kind of person I was in physical therapy school. I had a little bit of a reputation at least between myself and the people I was close with of being kind of a skeptic for this reason and part of that was you know you I think when you're a critic when you critically think and you start to like appraise whether the beliefs of your professors or the people that you look up to are actually in alignment with what the evidence shows or what other people you follow in the field are practicing it naturally is going to create some of those feelings of like hmm I want to go this way, but everyone in my field is going this way. Like, should I explore this route? And I feel like we've gone through phases in physio of like, should I explore the strength and conditioning route? Should I explore the pain science route? Should I explore this route? And oftentimes we get like wrapped up in the dogma of our universities that we go to and the people that we're around. And it's really hard (laughs) to just like put your stake in the ground and be like, this is what I believe to be the best way to practice. This is what I want to embody as a clinician. And I know that a lot of people aren't going to come along with me on this journey. And that's okay. That takes a lot of guts. And, you know, posture syndrome creeps in, um, feeling isolated and lonely creeps in. But also it yields conversations like this between us, where I feel like we have some similar shared values in this. So I'm with you. Yeah, for sure. And and I think where I would love to go next is like, you know, I would imagine the shift to doing what you're doing now as the burnout coach was driven by some form of burnout is my assumption, but maybe you could share a little bit of like that story as to like what then made that transition from like when you got out of physio school, you started practicing and now um, into doing what you're doing as a burnout coach. Yeah. Yeah. Cause <laughs> from the outside looking in you're like dude what are you doing like why did you go to physio school to become a burnout coach it doesn't make any sense so th- there's a, a good kind of non-linear uh path to what happened here so yes i went through burnout in my own way in physical therapy school and i'll be honest i didn't even know that that was a word until after i had went through it 
Now it's like the buzzword of the year and everyone knows it and uses it all the time. But essentially what happened was we were about to be in clinicals and you know, that feeling like when you're doing your choice day and you're, you're landing all your clinicals, you're like, I'm going to get the sports one. I'm going to get the acute care one for the shortest amount of time. Cause I'm not super passionate about that, but I'm like, I'm going to nail the like high level sports orthopedic one. And you have to apply to these places. And I remember getting my first one for an outpatient ortho. It was just like a classic outpatient ortho connected to a larger hospital system. And when the day rolled around, it was around the summertime. It was like two days before starting. I remember getting the email from my CI and them telling me the hours of the clinic and some of the things that I had to know before showing up. And I'm not exaggerating at all for the purposes of this story. Like my jaw dropped when I saw the hours that I would have to be at the clinic in a given week. I don't know if this is because I didn't do my research beforehand or I was expecting something different, but I was like, hmm, okay. So we got to start at 7 a.m. on some days, 8 a.m. is a late day. A lot of days we're here nine, 10 hours. We have a short day on Friday. Things that we now know are like classic outpatient orthopedic hours. But as a student, there is such a, an adjustment shock that hit me where I was like, I'm not getting paid. I have to drive over half an hour to get there. My entire day is gone. Even when I was a student in class, I still had time to work out, make dinner, hang out with my spouse. So that hit me initially. And I was like, this should be interesting because I'm already feeling some of the, the creepings in, creeping in of this doesn't feel right. So we get to the clinic. I start my clinical. And pretty immediately, I realized that there was a difference in philosophy. So I, I don't know where you guys went to grad school, but like every physio school has their own like little flavor of physical therapy, right? Some people are like more McKenzie. Some people might be more pain science. Like my school's thing was movement system. And we were taught that like, this is the Bible. Movement system is what you need to use. It's how we looked at all case studies and how we learned anatomy. And I'll be honest with you, like I resonated with it a lot. I still do in a lot of different ways to this day. But I learned in the first day of being on my clinical that my CI couldn't care less for this system. And they did not agree with it. And they, they honestly disagreed with it. And so immediately I'm just like, what the hell is this? Like <laughs> I spent all this time learning a certain approach and paradigm for physical therapy. I get to my clinical, I'm met with like a somewhat antagonistic take around like how this is not the way to treat human beings and it doesn't make sense. And so automatically I'm like, cool, I have to adopt a whole new lens and paradigm to practice physical therapy. And so that coupled with the hours coupled with the high patient caseload, I just started to feel like more and more like a shell of myself. So I wasn't sleeping great. I wasn't having the energy that I typically had. I wasn't getting into the gym as much. I started to see patients as numbers. I started to see patients as complainers. I didn't have that genuine apathy, or excuse me, that genuine empathy that I normally had for people in general. And I remember reaching out to my school to talk about this. No one really knew what was going on. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized like, oh, wow, there's this thing called burnout. And this is exactly how I feel. I feel this emotional exhaustion where I have a good night of sleep and I don't feel replenished to talk to my patients in an engaged way or come home and ask my wife how their day, how their day was. I feel this apathy where I'm in the clinic and I'm like, I don't have a ton of compassion. I don't have a ton of curiosity. I don't have a ton of empathy for my patients. And this just feels wrong when you're in healthcare where you're like, in the door, out the door, in the door, out the door mentality. And then also obviously the lifestyle changes of like not getting into the gym, not moving as much, feeling like I'm spending most of my day away from home and I'm not doing activities that I love anymore. In a nutshell, what I was going through was burnout and no one at the moment knew what that was. No one could kind of point me in the right direction of resources or what to do about it. And yet I'm hearing classmates come back from their clinicals yeah, I was crying in the car before clinical too, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I was running 10 plus hour shifts also and like feeling like my CI was just dumping stuff on me to do and I was getting home and having no time for myself. And I'm like, we're all just going through this? Like, <laughs> wait, time out. Or you get together with your classmate and you drink copious amounts of coffee and rant about it and then decide maybe we'll start a podcast and then we'll start... There you go. You guys turn that anger into something constructive. A lot of us just complain. First tears. First tears. <laughs> Don't you worry. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you're that's you're my kind of people. <laughs> we probably could have processed it a lot better. But 
it was so obvious that like everyone was going through this to some extent and never a lecture around burnout, never a lecture around like adjusting to this new stress that is work life. And so that's when things shifted for me where I was like, A, I do partially feel jaded that this is the reality of clinical practice for some people. And B, I think this is where I want to focus. Like, I don't know if chronic pain, low back pain, sports is going to be my area of interest anymore. I think that helping clinicians who are going through this as students and as clinicians, that's where it's going to be for me because I felt moved by that. And I did a couple things to help myself in my journey. And I wanted to put that into a program to help clinicians get out of burnout. One or two healthcare workers go through it nowadays. So, you know, are we making a tangible dent on it on like a scale level? Probably not as much as we need to. But one thing we definitely need more of is burnout coaches and coaches to help clinicians work through this. Yeah, totally. And I think like your whole story there, like every single person that's listening to this can resonate with that and have had somewhat of a similar experience. And it's almost as like, this is just something that's normal, which it's like a rite of passage in a way, which I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I think like there's, a, there's probably a lot of factors that go into why that scenario is happening. And like, we could probably go down a bunch of different realms as to why that is the case. But I think like the main focus I want to talk about is like, you know, the fact that it does exist and that people are going through it. And then how do we manage it for like the individual versus like, I think there's a bigger system issue going on here that, you know, we could, that we could go down, but like from your perspective, obviously having like definitely, you know, experienced yourself, made that transition to wanting to work with those people. I think like talking about burnout and then some of the ways that like you help clinicians identify it and you help people manage it is going to be, um, you know, super important. So from that perspective, like what are some ways that you help people start to, even be aware of this because I feel like a lot of times it's going on and there's just no awareness that it's happening. Um, and we just then start thinking like, well, I'm bad. I'm not great. I'm like, maybe I'm not cut out for this or I'm this imposter. Like, why are all these people like doing so great? You know? Um, so I think it'd be cool to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of taboo. It's like you, you have a, a beer with your friends or you're at dinner. It's like, you're not going to talk about your burnout or mental health journey. <laughs> like you're going to talk about work. You're going to talk about sports. You keep it superficial. So I do, I do think a lot of us clinicians, we kind of suffer in silence because these are not particularly sexy things to talk about. Last night, actually, I did a workshop for a couple of um, med students at Michigan around self-awareness and burnout. And I'm, I love that you asked that because this is where I think the conversation has to start for a lot of people, which is like, let's just see, let's just, can we see what's happening? Can we take an objective look at what's going on at this situation so we can start to make the proper changes for ourselves? Step one, what is even burnout? So there's kind of two flavors of this. We have the sort of research clinical definition, and then we have the kind of on the ground, what people can experience, experience of it. From a research standpoint, burnout, it's gonna be a syndrome. It's not like a diagnosable illness that you can kind of see and track and measure. It's a syndrome that is characterized by unchecked chronic workplace, workplace stress. And the way that that presents itself is you kind of have three things happening at the same time. You have a degree of emotional exhaustion, which is like I go to sleep and I wake up and I still feel tired and emotionally unavailable to most people in my life. You have a degree of apathy or cynicism where it's like you're in the clinic and you're like, I couldn't care less. Like, I don't care about these patients. You know, everybody's going to get sick. What is my, what is the purpose of my practice here? And then you have a degree of depersonalization, which is I'm showing up, but I feel like a shell of myself is at the clinic. You're almost out of body and you're not fully present and engaged in the moment. So from a research standpoint, you need all three of those in some varying amounts to classically have burnout. On the ground though, this looks a lot different. So the, the classic clinician burnout story, I'll paint you a picture. And if you guys start you know, feeling kind of down or sad as we're going through this, I promise we'll leave with some like actionable strategies to feel better about this. So <laughs> the typical clinician, this is someone who's like, you're waking up and your first thought is, damn, I'm mad that my alarm went off. Like I have to go to work now. 
and you stay in bed, you press the snooze button. <laughs> if this hits an emotional note, you guys can just let me know. <laughs> oh yeah, bro, you're you're speaking right to my soul. So keep, continue. <laughs> um, self awareness is step one. So you wake up, you have that alarm go off, and you're like, I'm gonna procrastinate my morning routine to the last second. Your body's sending you every excuse why you shouldn't get out the door on time. You finally get into your car to make it to work on time. By the time you get to work, it's really difficult to get the day started. It's hard for you to begin your productivity. It's hard for you to stay concentrated, to stay focused. And as you're progressing through the day, you start to realize like more and more patients just seem less and less like people to you. And you're kind of just on this revolving door, people coming in, coming out. You're not really going above and beyond to ask questions or get to know them or really dig into their story. By the time the end of the day comes, you've been watching the clock all day long. The end of the day comes, you're able to go home and you split. You're probably driving home with the music off because you're so overloaded from all the stress that happened in the clinic that day. You get home and you're simply not able to share about your day with your partner because you do not have the emotional capacity to do so. And you're also not able to ask them about their day. So this is one of the key distinctions between burnout and just like feeling kind of off or like you're going through a tough time. Burnout, it affects multiple domains of your life. It's not just like I'm having a hard time at work or I'm having a hard time with my spouse. No, you're having a hard time in almost every single domain of life, your relationships, work, yourself. So you get home, you struggle to connect with your partner. Maybe you're not calling your parents like you used to or calling your friends. Shower, eat, kind of just binge Netflix, scroll a little bit. You have these plans of going to the gym and doing some hobby. And honestly, you kind of just feel like a schlumpy dumpy. Like you're just, I'm not myself. That is what burnout can look like. You lay down, put your head down, start having questions about if you're in the right career field. Should you start looking for jobs? Should you start transitioning to another specialty? And it makes sleep difficult. We wake up and we start the entire day again. So that's what burnout can look like just for clinicians in general. So if you hear this and you resonate with that, consider that it maybe is taking place. Now, also what we have is we have these things called hidden signs of burnout. Hidden signs of burnout are not like things that are just hiding in the shadows. These are ways that your body is expressing stress that maybe you don't immediately associate it with that. So do you guys remember like the idea of homeostasis and what that's all about? I hope the listeners know what that means. Yep. But you have like this narrow bandwidth of heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, X, Y, and Z substrate in your blood. There's some range where that's healthy. It feels good. You can recharge, you can repair, you can reproduce. Stress is anything that comes in and knocks you out of homeostasis. And in an acute short amount of time, that's fine. That's how we're designed to operate. We address the stressor that asks for our attention. We deal with it. Once the stressor is finished, we turn down the stress response and get back into that homeostasis. Burnout is when we are triggering that stress response chronically for weeks on end, months on end, a very long time. And this is when your body starts to give you signs of, hey, I, I know that you're busy, but I really would appreciate if you could change up the environment or change up how you're interacting with the environment so I can get back to this homeostatic range that feels comfortable and calm. Can you do that for me? So what those signs might look like are things like you have repetitive thoughts or behaviors. So maybe you ruminate a lot. You chew over conversations that you had in the clinic or things you should have said differently, or you really struggle to make decisions about the future. You're worrying a lot. You go through repetitive behaviors like fidgeting, just physical and mental manifestations of energy almost being stuck in your body. And it's just trying to manifest itself in some way. That's one hidden sign. Another one is called chandeliering. Chandeliering is like, all right, let's say you go home and when your kids get home, they track like a little bit of mud on the floor every day and you don't care. You're like, they're kids. Who, can, who gives? Like, it's not a big deal. One day your kids do that after you've had a particularly bad day at the clinic and you blow up and you yell at them and you scream at them or you're driving and someone cuts you off and normally you don't give a crap. But now someone cuts you off and you have a bout of road rage. That chandeliering, it's when a, a stimulus that typically doesn't elicit a huge emotional response from you elicits a huge emotional response from you, a sign that our stress is not under control. On top of that, we're going to have kind of unexplained aches and illnesses. So maybe feeling like I have this weird lingering chronic back pain, or I get these common colds around really stressful times. 
just signs that my body is kind of revolting as a result of feeling stressed out for way too long. And then the last one that I think hits clinicians a lot is social isolation. So, you know, we've all seen the like <laughs> graphics on Instagram, like Surgeon General calls loneliness as deadly as, you know, smoking 10,000 packs of cigarettes a day. There's a lot of truth to that. Social isolation in the sense of that you're not hanging out with your friends. You are staying in less, or excuse me, you're staying in more and going out less. I forget how the Drake lyric goes. You're staying in more, you're going out less. And all of a sudden you're like, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the capacity. I don't want to hang out with friends. I don't want to hang out with my homies. And also because I'm lonely and by myself, I am now stressed out about being lonely and by myself. And that in and of itself is a stressor on yourself. So these are just a couple of different ways that burnout can manifest itself and show itself. And unless we are aware that it's happening to us in the moment, we're not going to make a change. We have to actually acknowledge that something is wrong here. So does that kind of make sense from like the, the awareness standpoint before di I gave you a lot there <laughs> before diving into like what to do about it? No, it's great. Cause I think those are like all super key things for people to like, even listening right now, pause and like reflect on that. Right. Like think about that because like, as you're telling those stories, I can think about that in my own journey. Right. Um, so, and I think this, the biggest part is that when you're in it, you don't realize it until it becomes too deep of a thing. And then something big happens and blows up. Right. And I've experienced that in my career and what I've tried to get better. And what's interesting is that like, I would say I'm now in a position where I feel fulfilled. I'm doing what I, like all of those things, but I still feel some of those things that you've talked about, um, like burnout, which probably just comes from not taking enough rest, not realizing how, how far I'm pushing the needle. But what I've tried to get better at is identifying what are those indicators that I'm getting to that point and then making like building in systems so that I don't end up getting to the point where I, where I blow up. Right. So I think like to your, to your point and all those things are great because people should use that as a, as a benchmark or as an indicator of like, okay, where am I? Is this me right now? Have I been here in the past or am I becoming, you know, that? So, yeah, I think it was great. Exactly. Exactly. And we're never going to be perfect with this. Stress is ever present. It's always going to exist. It's exactly what you said of, can I collapse the time between noticing one of my signs and doing something about it? Because if that time is too long, that's when we enter the suffering stage and we start to go through an unneeded amount of suffering in our experience. So the more we can create that self-awareness, the quicker we can then act on it. Figuring out the systems in place is a whole different conversation because it depends on the person that is going through whatever they're going through. But this is like a huge message that I try to get people of like, check in with yourself, please. Like either have an accountability partner. This can be someone like a therapist, a coach, a family member, spouse, friend that is going, that you know is going to check in with you and ask you how you're doing on an actual level or check in with yourself. Like have some cadence that makes sense for your situation where it's like every day at noon, I'm going to just ask myself, what am I feeling right now? How am I feeling? Am I anxious? Am I energized? Am I stressed? Am I content? Am I peaceful? And then use that as the driver for whatever the rest of your day looks like, or do this weekly or monthly. I just want us to get off of this autopilot mode that we sometimes fall into because it's safe and it's comfortable and it allows us to get through our days and start checking in with ourselves more often. So we can then make the actions needed to bring our stress back down. Yeah, yeah, totally. I like that you mentioned maybe having an accountability partner for it too, because I find like sometimes uh, like me and Dalton don't explicitly have that relationship, but I think we just naturally do it because we've been, you know, close for so long. And uh, sometimes he'll like, just be like, Hey, are, are, are you good? And I'm like, yeah, like it. I think so. <laughs> but then I think about it. And I'm like, hmm, like, I wonder why he's asking that. Maybe I'm showing some of those signs that I'm not even really, because you're just on autopilot. Like sometimes it is hard to look at yourself only. You know, it is nice, I find, to have somebody else be able to have that outside perspective because sometimes you just don't really notice uh, and it's like harder to see your own um, maybe manifestations of 
something like burnout. So I find when he brings it up, then I'm like, uh, you know, I, I am being a little more snappy with things and, and then I can look into it a little bit more. Yeah. Big time. It's I know that feeling of your like because he hasn't had a coffee yet is usually what it is. <laughs> but <laughs> no, fair, yeah, yeah. Don't ask me any calendar decision making before I have my coffee. Like, I'm not ready. I'm not in that mindset. Um, but I know that feeling 100 percent of you're like, hmm, okay, I'm good, but like I don't know why you asked that. And then you reflect for a second, you're like, yeah, I could have handled that a little bit better. And I'll be honest, like my my opinion on this is that so if you take what physios, chiros, any medical professional, what we do on a daily basis is we are caring for other people at a, a very root level. And that care is not normal compared to other professions. Like we're diving into the weeds of people's pain and their lives and their stories on top of trying to problem solve in the moment, different progressions or what we're seeing or whether we should refer out or whether we can handle this. And so it is a, it is a very taxing profession that we're in emotionally and physically. And so my thing is, I think everyone, every clinician needs to have someone that's looking after them, some caregiver taking care of them. It might not feel fair to just put that on your friends and your spouse because they have distinct roles that are not that. They're there to play those roles. But this is why I advocate having like a, a therapist or a coach in your corner, someone that's able to check in with you on some regular cadence, and then also kind of reflect back the behaviors you're exhibiting to yourself. Because typically, we suck at being objective with ourselves. We will tell ourselves every story in the book to rationalize the experience that we're going through, to feel better about ourselves, to pretend that this is all normal. And guess what? That's human. You're human. I'm happy you're doing that. And also that gets in the way of you making changes to best take care of yourself and impact those around you in the best way possible. So get someone else to do that for you because being objective with yourself is hard. We know this with patients all the time. Like it's impossible. So I'm with you guys. Kind of like the idea of like who actually programs Bulgarian split squats into their own workout. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That was a big one back in our baseball days. I love the Bulgarians. <laughs> I'm like, I'm always like writing my program and I'm like, should I? <laughs> right, right, right. Like, uh, I'll just do a step up instead, I guess. Yeah, I got to yeah, be functional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So like, I want to, so I want to hit on like what I would imagine are some of the things you can do about it. Like having an accountability yeah. partner, you know, getting a coach probably kind of fi falls in that realm. Like what are some other, and I know there's probably a lot of nuance to this based on each individual. Right. But maybe what are some other solutions or things that people can start implementing on like a surface level, maybe that can lead them down that path of like helping to take control of this a little bit. Yeah, big time, big time. So, okay, this is a big conversation because there's a lot of different things. Anyone that works with me, like we have a vast arsenal of things that we're going to use to tackle burnout. And when we say it's a very individual experience, that's not just like a cop out that like your professor tells you in, in physio school, like it depends. I don't know. That's not what that means. It, it, it means that we all have childhoods, upbringings, stories, and beliefs that we pick up along the way that influence the behaviors that we make. So if someone struggles with being a people pleaser, someone can't put themselves first, someone's going above and beyond all the time, or they're a perfectionist, or they're type A and really controlling and high achieving, those things don't just happen for no reason. You somewhere along the way likely picked up a belief as to why that behavior is better than not doing that behavior. And so part of the individual part of burnout recovery is understanding, all right, what are the stories and beliefs that are driving your behavior subconsciously? Let's shine a light on those. Let's then rewrite those because they're not serving you currently. And then what are the actions that we can take in order to re-ingrain re or ingrain those neural pathways in a new way? So for someone like a people pleaser, this is maybe getting down to the root cause of, all right, every time you go to say no, or you go to set a boundary, you don't do what we normally would do, which is just say no or set a boundary. And that could be because deep down you have this need for approval and you want to be accepted. And as a child, this is just an example. As a child, you may have learned that this is a coping strategy that allows you to survive and gain approval and acceptance from others. Because if you said no, or if you put up resistance, you 
you put yourself at risk for rejection. So you may carry that paradigm into your working life and start to wonder like, dude, I know everyone's telling me that I need to stop working at six and stop taking notes home. But like, I can't, like, I just feel bad. I feel guilty. I know in the long term, it's not good for me, but in the short term, I feel a little bit better and more comfortable by myself. That person, we can tell them all the tips in the world. Like, yeah, yeah, just put on do not disturb or like, yeah, yeah, just let your patients know in like your email footer that you don't respond after a certain hour. Those tips may or may not work. It's like throwing something on a wall and seeing if it sticks. Unless we get to the underlying belief as to why you're equating saying no with rejection or losing approval, we're not going to be able to get the behavior change that we want. So that's kind of like my big shtick is that if we're not changing identity and we're not changing beliefs, we're not changing anything. We're not going to have that sustainable behavior change that people want. There's some inklings of this from like the behavior analysis field or the motivational interviewing field, but it's like, we want people to come to their own conclusions. We want people to change their identities. We want people to change the stories that they're telling themselves. Now, that was kind of like the stuff that I'm responsible for as a coach to elicit out of you so we can understand what's going on. On the practical side, we also need things to do, tangible strategies that can address the stress we're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this is the what. We were talking about the why of why this is happening to you. Now we're talking about the what. The what is what do you have to do as an individual on a day-to-day -day basis to best support yourself. And typically, this is a combination of exercise and habits. So figuring out the exercise, because it's the best tool for stress reduction that we have, but the exercise that fits your lifestyle. AKA your coach, your physio, I know not everyone can do this, but they should have a general sense of your calendar and your schedule and your exercise preferences and whatever program they prescribe for you needs to fit that. Because if we're giving someone hour and a half strength-based workouts when they're working 45 hours a week and they have two kids at home, who's gonna stick to that? I wouldn't. So it's figuring out, all right, what is the kind of exercise that you're gonna be able to do consistently Let's prescribe that so you can do it as much as possible. Also, when you're doing this for stress, it's not as long or intense as it would be for strength or rehab or hypertrophy. If you're working out for stress, I'm just looking for 10 to 15 minutes, breaking a sweat, getting your heart rate up so we can then give your body the signal to turn down that stress response. And then there's the habit element. Habits, these are just things that take hopefully no more than five minutes a day that allow you to work on some skills that we know are good for your mental health. Self-compassion is a big one. So can you approach your inner critic that tells you that you are not good enough, that you are weak, that you're an imposter, that you chose the wrong profession, that you're spineless and you can't set boundaries? Can you approach that person with compassion as opposed to judgment? That's a huge evidence-based skill that we know tangibly helps people's mental health. It's also working on things like thought reframing, so if you have a repetitive thought going on over and over and over again, can we do this? I, I take this from cognitive behavioral therapy. Can we talk about the thought you're having, all the evidence for it, all the evidence against it, and then can we get to a new conclusion about this thought, a different way of seeing it, so we can reduce the amount of anxiety and stress that we're feeling about that given thought? And there's many other different skills and strategies around like positive reappraisal, can you see challenges as a positive experience and, and find the growth within them? Can you practice mindfulness? So I'm big on a mindful moment. This is just like in your day to day. I bet for you guys, it might be even the coffees you drink every day. But like, can you find that moment in the day that allows you to pull back into the present moment? Because we know mindfulness is so good for anxiety. And people think that it's just like a state of bliss you reach and you're just like sitting on a mountain somewhere and you're like, stuck in this permanent state of presence. That's not what it looks like. It's just, can you pull yourself into the sensory world right now through something you see, smell, touch, feel, hear? That is very important. It's a big skill that we work on. So there's a lot of other habits and different things that come up along the way, like doing enjoyable activities for yourselves. But the, the broad point here is, can we figure out every day something, some exercise, some habit to do for yourself so we can start putting a little bit more attention back onto our needs and our uh, requirements as human beings to feel healthy, happy, and whole. And then the last part of this is just the how, I call it, which is how do we get you to do all this? This is what I think separates really good coaches from amazing coaches or really good physios from amazing physios is can we help people with implementation? Can we help people with behavior change? 
Typically this comes in the form of coaching support and accountability. So like someone that you're able to contact me and talk to me along the week to let me know about challenges that are coming up or things that aren't working for you. That implementation piece is where I think a lot of healthcare falls flat in that we are taught this boatload of information of things that are helpful for people. And we just say, do it, like figure it out, make it work in your life. How bad do you want it? And then from another perspective, you're like, that's not how behavior change works. That's not how people actually change their lifestyles tangibly. We have to find the entry point. We have to change the story. We have to change the identity and we have to cater the intervention to where they're at right now and then build up from there. So you just made me describe my job in a nutshell. I know it was a lot, but that's, that's what well, coaching recovery looks like. Yeah. I love it because like, <clears throat> I think in the, uh, the essence of everything you just talked about is like people who are going through this need to commit to working with someone like you, because that's the, out of all that, we can talk about all those little things that you just talked about mindfulness, you know, looking at our behavior, taking moments. Like these are all things that most people know about, but how do we implement them consistently and know what's individual to me comes from working with a coach. It's the same thing that we sit here and preach about rehab and injury. And especially like the way that we approach care at the movement is, is like that, but just like in the context of rehab. Right. And I think like as a professional or as someone who's going through this, if you're taking like some of those identification tools that you just gave us and you're realizing, Oh shit, this is me. And now I need to do something about it. It's like you need to commit to taking control of that and working with someone that can help you on an individual level. Just like I would encourage someone to commit to taking control of their health by working with us to improve their pain and injury so that they can get back to what they love. It's the same thing. But without committing to going deep on that, you're probably never really going to solve that issue. Like you could probably only get so far on your own. And so I think like after people go through all that, what you just talked about, I think at the end of it, I'm hoping they're like, yeah, I need to talk to Ricky or I need to explore this more with someone who can guide me through this. And we need to be okay with getting help from people. <laughs> You're speaking my language. This is what I'm talking about. There's a, a wonderful quote that like one of my mentors um, uses all the time, which is like, if self-reliance was the solution, you would have it all figured out by now. Yeah. And clearly self-reliance is not the solution. We suck at being objective with ourselves. We suck at sticking through plans that we set out for ourselves. And it's not a, a flaw. This is just human beings. We do what's safe. We don't do what's best for us. Typically, when we externalize that pressure and we externalize that accountability from someone else giving it to us, that's when we're able to implement and stick to things better. So I, I find this all the time with healthcare workers. And I think it's because we are some of the smartest, like well-adjusted, high-achieving people is that we think if we understand the problem, that we can solve the problem. And I want people to realize that like information doesn't equate to action. And you knowing what's happening in your body doesn't equate to a change in behavior or habits that ultimately changes your life. Like that might feel like a comfortable thing to tell yourself and intellectualize it away. But I know firsthand, like when I first started a business, I was using things I learned on Instagram from other people. And I was like, why isn't this working? Because I didn't know how to implement and it wasn't advice catered to my situation. Or like when I, you know, dislocated my shoulder because I fell on the stairs one time. I didn't actually go end up seeing a physio. I probably should have. But the point is, you know, you, you think because you can understand what's going on and you know what the best practice is that you can just step into that identity and step into that behavior change. But oftentimes the hack that you're looking for is just hiring someone, hiring an expert, hiring a coach that nails implementation and nails behavior change. Because once ideally you go through that process with them, you now have the habits and the mindset in place to keep doing that for yourself. But unless someone sets that foundation up for you, you go through these like boom bust cycles of like, I was consistent with my rehab for a couple of weeks, but I then fell off because life got hectic. All right. That's where the work is at. And that's where a professional can help you figure out how to keep going when your sleep sucks and work sucks and you're tired. You're speaking the same language here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we go on forever. So I want to transition to wrap, wrapping up here, but the craziest part about all that is like, you as a clinician know that because you do that every single day with the people that you work with. That is the crazier part. And like, I'm not like, I fall prey to that too. But like, 
the one thing I'm learning as we go on more and more is like, I need to think of what do I preach on a daily basis in the context of rehab and where else does that challenge that those clients are having show up in my life in the way that's relevant to me. It's probably not rehab, but maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's burnout, maybe it's mental health, maybe whatever. So like it's, it's a, it's an interesting way that we operate as humans, but um Ricky, I really appreciate this conversation, man. I think it was great. Um, I think, you know, we we align a lot. I think like the thoughts that we have um, are, are very, are very similar. And like, when I think about the mentorship and the things that we're trying to do with that, a lot of what you are talking about very much aligns with how we're approaching, you know, trying to have clinicians think about their career. Um, so, so I really appreciate you taking the time and I would love for you to like, let people know where they can find you on Instagram. If they want to work with you or learn more about what you do, um, let them know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've appreciated this too. This has been a really good start to my day. Um, if you want to find me, I'm on Instagram, Ricky underscore the burnout coach. It's just like a big orange head. Like you can't miss it. It's myself. So Ricky underscore the burnout coach. Say hi if you're feeling friendly. Um, you know, I think one thing that I just want to like leave your audience with, because I remember those early days of being in school and feeling a little bit like a black sheep because of the way I thought about physio and rehab. And I want to emphasize that like, it's okay if you're a student or a clinician to find the echo chamber that resonates with you. Ideally, this is one that is evidence-based and all those good things that we know. But whether it's you guys, whether it's Cal U, the clinical athlete level up community, whatever that is in your locale or your ecosystem, like find the clinical mentors that are going to validate and support the skepticism or ideas that you have not knock it down and shut it down, like which may happen in more traditional academic circles or with other people in like the clinics that you work with. Like you're not weird for thinking about innovative or different ways of approaching the field. You just have to find the right people that are willing to support that. And like you guys exist. So it's proof in the pudding that you're out there. We just have to take advantage of technology and the internet to find what that is for ourselves. Because if I didn't find, it wasn't, obviously you guys played a big part, but also that Cal U community also played a big part for me. If I didn't find them in that mentorship, like I wouldn't be in the field anymore. I probably would have pivoted to something else because I would have felt completely misaligned with any clinics around where I live. And I, I just wouldn't have felt like I was able to live out the values I have as a human with being a clinician. But because I found them, they helped me reframe my mindset around how to practice and, and embody the values that I care about as a clinician in the, in the clinic. And so it was a game changer. So find those people, like look for them. You have interesting and nuanced and novel thoughts and other people do too. They're just in the minority. Just got to find where they're at. But thank you guys. Love it. Awesome. Ricky, thanks so much for your time, man. Um, really appreciate it. 100%.